All right, uh, we are at 11.03, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining the September edition of Cannes Journal Club. Uh, I'm here with Saman Razani, and today we're going to be talking about general safety measures for extraction facilities and how to prevent workplace incidents. So I'll go ahead and introduce Saman and give a little bit about him. Uh, so Saman is a lean-minded pioneer of the regulated cannabis industry. Uh, he has more than 12 years of experience in the regulated cannabis extraction and manufacturing sector with a wide range of skills, including research and development, chemical and biological sciences, facility design, operations, employee training, marketing, and branding. Saman's extraction expertise includes volatile extraction technologies and methods, including hydrocarbons like butane, propane, and heptane, as well as non-volatile extraction methods, including ice, water, and more. Saman is known in the industry for building, executing, and managing the manufacturing arms of some of the largest and most successful cannabis companies across the country, including the Green Solution, uh, Sweet Leaf Marijuana Centers, Grow Healthy, INSA, Glasshouse Group, and, um, and others. Saman has also served as an expert giving testimony in McRory's nursery versus the state of Florida's uh, Department of Public Health and Office of Compassionate Use, an unprecedented cannabis case in the state of Florida, as well as executed and launched uh, production in California for companies such as Wonder Brett, Cresco Labs, Team Elite Genetics, Field Extracts, and Hello Again Products. Saman, we are very happy to have you with us today, and I'll let you go ahead and kick things off. Thank you so much for the uh, warm introduction, Kyle. <clears throat> it's an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, presenting to you all. I, I've watched the previous Journal Club um, um, uh, you know, events online here, and I'm just impressed. I'm impressed with the, you know, just the quality um, of people that are, that are interacting here and uh, honored because I definitely don't have all of your guys' knowledge. My little knowledge I have though, pertains to extraction, um, manufacturing facilities. And so hopefully I'll be able to impart a little bit of, of knowledge on everybody and show uh, some, some certain accidents and mishaps and how to prevent those as well, common stuff that we see um, and some uncommon as well. So thanks again. Um, I think we're ready to jump in. So I can just, let me go ahead and uh, play this thing. Okay. <clears throat> so, Sorry, just give me a sec. I gotta move everyone's faces out of the way here. Okay. Okay, so general safety measures for extraction facilities and how to prevent workplace incidents. A look into the building requirements surrounding commercial scale extraction facilities, operations, uh, common lab mishaps and catastrophic failures, as well as accident prevention. <clears throat> so just a little brief history, because I wanna just get everyone up to speed. Um, extraction equipment operators and lab techs, the day-to-day -day work can often be dangerous and complex. Hazardous processes using volatile flammable chemical solvents, um, glassware exploding under pressure. It just leads to an unsafe environment, especially if you're not paying attention. So safety is always of utmost priority and should be taken seriously. You don't wanna be like our friend here on the right and uh, just willy nilly in the lab. <clears throat> so what goes on in an extraction lab? Well, You've heard the term from soil to oil. So we take the plant and we basically concentrate all of those chemical compounds and create an oil. I've added a little flow chart for you guys just so you can see how it works. We can create different levels and different concentrations of these oils. We can isolate them to create really pure products as well. But essentially we take that soil to oil and what, I, what I've added is actually we take it from soil to CPG. So consumer packaged goods is where all of these things end up if they're not in their raw oil form. So we can take those isolated or those full spectrum cannabinoids, the minor cannabinoids that are there, the terpenoids, the, fla uh, you know, the flavonoids, the polyphenols, ketones, whatever compounds are in there, we could take them and we can utilize those in many different products. So it's just a little, uh, it's a little visual for you there. The extraction lab is where raw cannabis biomass is processed to create a concentrate AKA hash, we all, we, you know, a lot of people in the cannabis industry call any concentrate hash. And then there's people that create the solventless product hash. And uh, they're very particular about what they call hash, but we just generalize and we call all, you know, concentrates part of the hash family. So there's different consistencies, there's different products and there's different ways to make this stuff, but shatter, distillate, crumble, batter, um, pure crystalline isolated cannabinoids, whatever, whatever will end up in a crystalline um, 
manner, actually. Uh, some cannabinoids in, in their pure forms don't create crystals um, because of the, the other compounds that are there. Usually it's like a carboxyl group, a CO2 group. Um, rosin, that's a solventless product that's mechanically pressed uh, from dry sift, which is just the, you know, beaten trichome heads that are collected and uh, kind of coagulate and congeal together on their own. And then we have full spectrum oil that's created from like an ethanol. Uh, this actually, this oil is made with hydrofluorocarbons in Lompoc, California. So, uh, so R134A is what we use. <clears throat> those products, those raw cannabinoids, we take those, we infuse them with other ingredients to make this range of, of different products. And there's a lot that you can do. Um, I've added a couple of things on here that maybe you've seen and maybe you haven't. Suppositories, gummies, I think everybody's seen those, but you get the point. I just wanted to give a little background. Why are, cannab why are cannabis concentrates important? Renowned across the globe for its potency and efficacy, this product often called hash, as we discussed, uh, is, is the concentrated chemical constituents of the cannabis plant. So it's just a more efficacious, more potent product than you're going to get in the raw flower. And it, and it does wonders for people with chronic pain issues or, or just any kind of chronic issue. Um, today, it's concentrated with solvents, like we discussed, or it's, you know, separated manually or mechanically or disassociated with the use of water. The creation of hash is a special and ancient method. People have been consuming this product, this, and, and not in this specific way, but in some form uh, for centuries. And we've seen that through, um, through hieroglyphics in Egypt, Mesopotamia. One of the most recent, my favorite uh, hieroglyphic, uh, how hash really works. Um, this is it. Just kidding. That's not a hieroglyphic anyway, but you get the point. Now, the building requirements surrounding these commercial facilities, they have proliferated over the last few years. So we've seen a lot change um, via code and text um, since 2018. So we're going to discuss some of this, and you're going to get a glimpse into kind of all of the codes and standards that go into creating a facility and what a... Um, person developing or designing this facility has to take into consideration. So these are common codes um, that, that lend their value to, to the developer as a guideline. So we have ASME specs, which, which basically covers anything that's like a pressurized vessel that we're using to do any kind of extraction. So the OEM the original equipment manufacturers will also have to design and spec their equipment with these with some of these same codes in mind asme specifically um, international building code has new sections that are directly correlated to cannabis or just general plant extraction um, nec national electrical code that actually is tied with the National Fire Protection Association code. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, NRTL and UL listing, this is, a, this is a standard for most everything else electronically that we buy, uh, uh, consumer products, lamps, um, anything you plug in really, um, other than cannabis extraction equipment from overseas, from, from places that don't carry the same standard. So now this is a requirement that everything you use that you plug into a wall has to have the certification no matter what. Um, there are ways to get these certs uh, in the field, but it, it does take quite a bit to do that. Um, International Mechanical Code uh, is a big, big part of this. All the hazardous ventilation is, is tied to that code and you can look up chapter 501 in IMC and you can find some of that. National Fire Protection Association code. This is probably um, the, the biggest regulating body for, for cannabis and essentially um, kind of combines a lot of these different code languages into one general code, specifically discussing cannabis extraction um, from anywhere from cultivation to manufacturing, even to like, you know, the distribution area as well. So there's many codes, as you could say, I listed them all. I'm going to get into discussing some of them, but the biggest ones are really the chapter one, um, the, the new NFPA one chapter 38. That's, that's basically the, the Bible, if you will, for these facilities. Um, another important one for any hydrocarbon operator out there or CO2 operator is the Compressed Gas Association Code, um, P1, chapter 
um, uh, P chapter one is there is there code requirements for these facilities so you can find everything you need there. Um, and international fire code that ties in with the NFPA code a lot, um, but it does have its own autonomous code language. And then lastly, uh, OSHA, which is which is kind of a new regulating body in our in our sphere here. Um, California actually implemented the first uh, mandate for for having a uh, thirty hour course if you are you know operating one of these facilities. So there has to be a certain amount. I think it's like two or more people that have to have the 30 hour OSHA course in California specifically, um, you know, for, for you to be um, considered operating above. So each jurisdiction will supersede the national code, unfortunately. So every uh, development project, though it may be the same, the same concept, the same, the, the same design parameters that you've built before, each authority having jurisdiction, unfortunately, will interpret those codes differently. So a big, a big part of the process here is um, being flexible and understanding that there could be uh, different interpretations of uh, the same code that you're reading and that you've already completed. So we'll get into a lot of this uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, occupancy, when designing and building these facilities is essential. It's probably one of the most uh, important determining factors of what you're doing and how much solvent you're gonna be able to use on site. Um, typically, there's two different code classifications. There's an F occupancy, and then there's an H occupancy, an F occupancy. And if you're in the cannabis industry and you're doing manufacturing specifically, you're either gonna be an F or an, or an H. Um, F1 is like factory one, they call it. So factories can have some solvents. This is more, I don't wanna say bench scale, but it's, it's, it's under five gallons of usage basically. Anything over that is gonna, they're gonna analyze that. They're gonna analyze the storage um, capacity, the storage area, even um, you know, what you're storing it in. If it's a, the flammable cabinet, if it's a cage, um, if it's in, in an open room that meets all the, um, the requirements for the, pr the pressure that can expand from an explosion, um, the, the wall coating to make sure that's not gonna catch on fire, um, even the velocity of air. So there's different ways that you can go about it, but essentially um, occupancy is gonna determine how much solvent you're allowed to have and what classification, how many people you can have working in that area. So something to, to look into in your own jurisdiction that you're gonna start in. The occupancy relies heavily on information given um, by, the, by the operator. So the architect in this case is gonna be the one that's gonna be uh, generally compiling these requirements um, based on you know, the description. So the, one of the biggest pieces of this occupancy um, code is how much solvent you're gonna be able to use on site. So this is just an excerpt um, from, from some of the code that is what type of solvent, how much solvent, and what your classification will be if you exceed a certain limit. So this is just a, a little clip, but essentially there's multiple maximum allowable quantity requirements per jurisdiction. It just really depends on where you are and what the, what the fire marshal in the end of the day will let you let you do. But this is going to dictate um, what area of your building that you're putting the, the extraction um, the extraction area. In some cases you have to meet a certain requirement of the perimeter of the building. So you have to you have to be approximately for having let's say an H occupancy facility, you have to have 25% of an outside perimeter sharing wall has to be that area has to be covered with your um, H occupancy hazardous control area. So that's a large, that's a large area in most cases, and you have to meet their, you know, ventilation requirements in that area, um, and that's a, on a linear foot basis. So the, the wider, bigger you go, taller you go, the more air you're going to have to move through there, which means bigger fans, more electricity, more weights. A um, lot of a lot of things can um, can snowball very quickly in this process. As far as NFPA, um, we're discussing chapter 39, which is basically kind of the Bible, as I discussed. Um, this, is, this covers extraction by use of solvent. 
desolventizing the raw material, production of the micella, which is like the slurry, um, with, which has your active compounds in it and your solvent. The distillation of the solvents from the micella, so just the separation of the solvent recovery. Um, and solvent recovery is just a little redundant in, in here, but you get the point. Um, NFPA 169 speaks specifically to transfilling operations. So filling vessels, filling containers from storage containers of solvent. So this is a very important piece because um, there's implications of radius that are involved here. Vehicle traffic is an issue because they can create some spark or something. And if there's any kind of uh, vapor in the air, is, it depends on what the surface to, to volume ratio is, but it could create issues if that's in, uh, if that's in a close proximity on a continuous um, basis. So chapter uh, 69 speaks about the transfilling, and this is a this is kind of a an expansion of NFPA 58, which is the original code for transfilling. They've expanded it to include some of the issues that have been created and caused by operators in our industry doing things in an unsafe manner. So that NFPA 58, this is the radius kind of um, diagram that I was referring to. So it gives you an understanding of how far you need to be uh, from this point of transfer to things like egresses or ingresses from buildings, um, from any other you know uh, container or other uh, other area that's storing other solvents. And there's just a lot that goes into it. So we use these these uh, diagrams um, for ourselves in order to make sure that we're doing things by the code, by the book, exactly it's uh, meant to be done. The Compressed Gas Association Code. Um, this specifically discusses pressurized cylinders, um, how, you know, how we're handling those, how we're moving those, how we're storing those, withdrawing them, um, flammable gases, compressed gases that go in them, um, poisonous gases as well and pressurized liquid oxygen, nitrogen, and argon. Um, typically, you're seeing more of this in like the welding kind of arena, but because of our use with nitrogen and argon in our industry, um, that's now adopted uh, basically for what we do as well. And if you've never seen you know, nitrogen use with hydrocarbons per se, what we're using these pressurized gases for is to kind of push solvents out of the material column to collect it all and then to also create a safer environment when we, when we uh, you know, take that material out of the column to kind of um, desolventize and, and uh, air dry, if you will. Cal State OSHA, Department of in <clears throat> Industrial Relations. Um, their, their new language is very clear. It says all employers in the cannabis industry, including those who cultivate, manufacture, distribute, sell, and test can, uh, marijuana products. Sorry, I call it cannabis. I, I, I try not to use the pejorative word of marijuana. Um, they must take steps to protect their employees from all health and safety hazards associated with, with their work. And it's a, it's a very serious thing. Uh, there's huge huge implications for um, liability when it comes to doing volatile processes like this in an inadequate area. So OSHA and these other regulating bodies will start to be more involved in the policing of that. Um, again, the effective training that's required by section 3203 is that 30 hour general industry outreach training that's required um, in the state of California uh, is probably soon to be national, but California definitely takes the lead in that. Other OSHA requirements pertaining to extraction and just the physical use of what we do. Uh, they are, a lot of, most of them are in, are, are in uh, 1900 and that's the emergency action fire prevention, emergency requirements for the use of compressed gases, storage and handling of LP gas, personal protective equipment. So, you know, we're really, we're really happy to see Yvonne in her PPE because she's following these rules. Um, specifications for making physical hazards and accident prevention signs and tags, uh, portable fire extinguishers that are that are recommended and, and mandated, and hazard com hazardous communications. That's something that not a lot of operators do in our field. Um, it's it's just giving your employees and everyone in that facility a better chance um, to understand the, the the risks and the liabilities involved. IFC, International Fire Code, 
very important piece, just as important as NFPA, essentially because they kind of expand on each other mostly, but um, IFC has their own code, which is also chapter 39. Um, it focuses on the processing of extraction of oils and fats from various plants. The process includes extraction by use of solvent, desolventizing the raw material, production of micellar. So it's very similar to what we've seen uh, in other code language. A lot of this you know, conforming to the to standard is just that they need to standardize it. So everybody, every code language has to say the same thing. Um, so everyone knows they have to adhere at least to this bare minimum um, requirement. Um, one of the excerpts from chapter 39, extraction process equipment must be reviewed during a site inspection from the same registered design professional or firm, like a professional engineering firm, uh, employing an approved professional uh, which authored the equipment report in accordance with IFC section 3904. So what this says is that the uh, original equipment manufacturers that create the extraction equipment, they're mandated to get a peer reviewed by an engineering group. But what this code is saying is that same engineering group. So we can't use a different group, the same one that signed off and stamped the peer review from the OEM, they have to actually do the, uh, the, uh, the field report, we call it the field inspection of when the equipment gets hooked up and, and reviewed in someone else's uh, lab to make sure that they're not using anything that's not approved for use, uh, that they're sticking to the manual as far as operations. And that covers um, the, the engineers as well. So this is, uh, I don't want to say new, it's fairly new. This has been happening for a, a few years now, but in other states, um, it's just starting to come online. So essentially there's multiple review processes and steps, not only from your authorities having jurisdiction locally municipal in the municipality, but from professional engineering groups that have to come and certify. So this is an important step to ensure that the, the inception of these projects is going smooth. Accidents happen, everyone knows, but if, you know, if that's not taken care of initially, it could create even further problems downstream. Building design. Um, so we're going to take all those building requirements and we're going to put them to use in creating a functional dynamic facility that can uh, produce whatever you need to produce and package and, and do all of those all of those uh, tasks and processes that you need to conduct. Um, this is actually a, a building that I designed. So I'm not just you know stealing this from the internet, but um, essentially the the design philosophy is is kind of created by those design requir requirements. So, you know, you have to design with, with all of those things in mind. So you ensure success and, and not too much time goes on between when you start uh, the design process to when you, you know, submit for a building permit. Based on the code standards, um, the, the main, kind of the main elements here that you're gonna see are sprinkler systems, um, catchments for solvents and sprinkler water, uh, if drainage into waste system is not permitted. So for instance, if you are in an area that's uh, draining into the, into the ocean and you're very close in proximity to the ocean, um, the catchments that you're gonna have to add there are for things like, uh, let's say solvent area where you have a thousand gallons of liquid solvent. Well, with, with the solvent that you have to capture also comes uh, requirements for capturing the water that's that's coming out of the sprinkler head. Each head for an approximate amount of time, I think like it's like 20 minutes or 40 minutes or something like that, um, that you have to calculate. So the situation becomes interesting when, when this happens and it's not on your plan because that's a lot of money that you have to spend to cut the floor to drain this liquid, potentially drain this liquid, might not even happen ever, but you have to have a plan um, into like a sump basin and then pump that into like a storage container that's like thousands of gallons. That later you have to have a hazardous waste hauler come haul out because obviously you can't drain it. Um, other things that we see sometimes like that are, are the condensate from our machines that are coming off in the processes from the condensed from the chillers that are condensing um, through the process we're getting you know massive amounts of condensation uh, that's just kind of leaking on the floor if you have a drain in your area that you're doing that you're conducting this process in 
sometimes they'll make you test that water. And if uh, I, I, I don't know, some other people on this call could probably, probably answer this better, but how they test that is like, I think they put like a fish in a, in a thing of water and they put the condensate water in there. And if the fish survives, it's good. Um, but, but that's kind of what we're, what we're dealing with is, um, you know, we're, we're really, we're really getting to a standardized point in time here. And this is gonna be stuff that more people are gonna see. Um, also on those code standards, gas detection systems with interlocks. So fire alarm panel and enunciator panels are kind of autonomous, but they have to, they have to communicate together. So what, what usually what the, what the code requires is that in your hazardous control area where you're performing a hazardous process, you have a calibrated um, device, kind of like what's on the right side here of the screen. Um, this is a hydrocarbon, this is a, it's calibrated for hydrocarbon, but it'll also do like um, ethylene gas. It'll also do ethanol um, vapor as well. So you can, you can test the vapor in the air uh, for a lot of different chemical compounds, but essentially what happens is once this alarm starts going off and you know, what, what primarily it's connected to is like a fan. So a bigger fan than what the constant draw is out of that area. And so it's going to tell that fan that there's an unsafe level of chemical vapor in the air and it needs to reduce that level. So uh, essentially it's going to, it's going to communicate with the fan. It's going to start to blow. And if that, let's say there's a leak and let's say that it leak gets worse and that level of unsafe air uh, in the in the area rises and it becomes you know it, it be, the volume increases and we're we're in a way more unsafer level now. Um, well, typically what the fire marshal wants to see is a shunt trip they call it or just an interlock with the electrical components um, minus emergency stuff so like fans, lighting, exit, exit. Uh, you know, pathway lighting, so that if there is a catastrophic failure, it won't affect any other part of the facility, just that area. So that's that's one thing that's um, that's required now that maybe three years ago wasn't actually required. Um, fire alarms need to be complete with um, audio, like auditory and visual devices, horns and strobes. Um, so anybody who maybe is hard of hearing or deaf, they would be able to. Uh, you know, to, to remain safe in a, in, a, in a failure or a accident situation. Uh, if a building, <clears throat> if, if building a C1D1 control area special, if you're building it out of construction materials, not out of paneling, like a lot of the C1D1 um, spaces that you're seeing, if you're building it out of normal materials, you're gonna have to use specialty material. Um, things like welding the frame together, um, shear board, you'll see that word shear board. This is a metal backed, a steel backed drywall. And um, it's, it, it, it basically will prevent any, any outward pressure or force from an explosion, um, from like damaging anything and blowing out walls. And so uh, there, the construction for these areas is intense. If you're if you're planning on doing this, I suggest going with one of the prefabricated um, uh, booths because you really don't want to get into the cost and the headache of, of just building it, but you can. And I and I wanted to make sure everyone knew you can. So what the heck is a C1D1 area? Uh, what C1D1 actually is is it's an electrical classification that's covered in NFPA 70. And that is tied directly with the National Electrical Code, the NEC. So what it's describing is it's, it's requiring only rated non-sparking or spark-free constructed components to be operated in this hazardous area. Um, and it, it, it literally states an ignitable concentration of flammable gas or vapors may exist under normal operating conditions or as a result of repair maintenance or leakage. So this is one of these areas where there's always gonna be some level of danger. Um, that what that danger is, I guess, it just depends on what you're doing that day and, and how uh, well the equipment's been maintained to that point. Um, but the breakdown or faulty operation of equipment may A, release ignitable concentrations of flammable gases or vapors, or B, cause simultaneous failure of electrical equipment. So want to make sure that everything in that space um, meets all of the requirements um, and, and basically is not going to be an unsafe area of work. 
It's also required for the storage or, or operation of class 1A flammable gases or liquids. So that's uh, solvents like butane, propane, um, pentane, a lot of different alkanes will be covered in, in this uh, class 1A flammable gas, but um, that's really the highest, one of the highest kind of requirements is, is that level. Um, the volume of butane, propane, and pentane depends um, on your occupancy, as we discussed before. However, I could say that with, with, com with compressed flammable gases like butane and propane, you're only going to be able to have a certain amount of, of that solvent on site, period, regardless of your, um, your occupancy or whatever. Inside your facility, it's 300 pounds, no matter if you're an H1, an H2, an H3, or an F1. Um, if you are storing it outside, however, um, that's okay. You just need to meet those requirements in NFPA 58 um, and in 69, which were the transfill. So they have to be in an area that um, the cylinders are safe. So more code from CGP uh, or uh, compressed gas code uh, P1. So that's that's going to dictate where you can have it. Um, you have to have a concrete pad, you have to have a certain cage to put it in, they have to be strapped to the cage. Um, all of those things matter, but if it's outside your facility, um, that volume could increase. So that's something that you're, you're just going to have to ask your uh, authority having jurisdiction. What in the heck is a C1D2 area? So much like a C1D1 area, C1D2 has a, a some element of danger uh, uh, all the time, but the solvents that we're using are gonna be a little less intense. They're not gonna be, most of them aren't gonna be flammable gases, which is really the biggest deal. Um, the surface to volume ratio of a vapor versus a liquid, I think we all can understand that the vapor is more dangerous there. If you spill, even a few gallons of ethanol on the ground, that surface area is limited and something's really gonna have to spark right on that area to, to create a fire hazard. Whereas vapor can permeate anywhere and it, and it creates much, much bigger issues um, if that volume is, is, you know, is a couple, same couple gallons. So it's a lower rating than a C1D1 control area still requires specialty construction components if you're gonna build that room. Um, but essentially it's volatile flammable liquids or flammable gases um, are also handled here, just less flammable or, um, or you know, lower pressure gases as well. But the hazardous liquids uh, will normally be confined within the closed container, carboys, some kind of vessel, some dew or something. Um, an ignitable concentration of gases and vapors are normally prevented by positive mechanical ventilation. Uh, adjacent to C1, it's usually it's going to be adjacent to a C1D1 area as well. So I have a diagram in here that's going to depict kind of what the code requires as far as leaving one hazardous location and entering into an unclassified location. So C1D2 rooms mostly are used as buffers for C1D1 rooms, but you can also conduct safe operations in a C1D2 location for, per, for let's say, ethanol extraction. Um, and if you're using ethanol, again, you're going to have to refer to the maximum allowable quantity of ethanol per that, uh, per that location and make sure that you're following all the rules. This is that diagram that I was uh, just discussing. So as you see, um, at the top of your screen on the left, it says class one division one extraction. So imagine that's your area that you're conducting your process. You have airflow going from left to right across the area. And then you'll notice the doorway on the bottom uh, left side. That doorway there has a three foot swing on it. So they count that as three feet. Now that C1D2, um, kind of that, little, that little area there that's colored in, that's, that is basically showing and discussing what I, what I, was, what I was just saying. If you come from a classified area, to a non-classified area, there has to be a buffer there where there is no components or no electrical that would never be allowed in the C1D1 room because of its proximity to the, to the egress of that room. So uh, essentially they just wanna make sure that wherever you're doing your hazardous process, you don't walk right into an area where if some of that vapor potentially got out of the control area, it wouldn't affect anything beyond that area. 
So this is just a safeguard. Now, you'll also notice that there's some elements in your waste bin extraction equipment, and then you see wall penetrations for vacuum, heated water, coolant, compressed air. So what this what this is is this is just you know this is part of our safe operation. We can't we cannot really conduct what we need to conduct in one space. We have to use condensing chillers. We have to use heaters. We have to use a lot of different um, electrical components to kind of get this to work um, in an economically feasible fashion. So what we have to do is we have to place those uh, we have to place those um, support ancillary support equipment units in a different area, in a safe area that can have whatever electrical component they need. And we use pass-throughs. So rated pass-throughs or uh, penetrations with, you know, fire caulk or fire putty around it to kind of seal that up and, and to maintain its, you know, fire, in, uh, you know, its integral fire rating there. But essentially, um, the, the diagram on the right kind of shows how we do that. We, we add, we have our heating zone, we have our our chilling zone, and they run through a wall with just the chiller lines or the heater lines. Now it has to be plugged in in that room, but because we're using these lines to to move the fluid, um, we're allowed to do that through through a wall, and that helps us to um, you know to minimize the travel of the the process piping, which really reduces the delta the delta temperature between your, you know, your heating or cooling apparatus to your vessels that you're heating and cooling. And that's an essential also. Um, you, you, you're losing efficiency the longer you go. So we're able to do these things in a very practical manner, which is great um, by, by way of, uh, you know, using the code to our advantage. As far as hazardous ventilation per International Mechanical Code, this is another um, diagram and schematic that was drawn up in one of the plans that I created to kind of give a general idea of how the air moves in these, in these uh, operating control areas. So hazardous ventilation for any adjacent area will also have to, uh, the, I'm sorry, hazardous ventilation for any adjacent area that will be refining the product that still could contain some solvent will also have to have the same essentially the same ventilation system. When I say ventilation system, I mean it has to go through a hazardous, uh, a hazardous classified or a spark reconstructed fan. Um, these fans are specialty construction, not that they're super expensive, but they're, they're different than normal fans in the sense that there is no centralized motor where the air is passing through, not in line. It's, it's, driven by a belt in most cases um, to a pulley that will that will spin the turbine to, to create that pressure. So in our case, in this facility, this is showing actually the C1 D1 room um, and how the airflow works. Fresh air comes in. We have to have fresh air come in because you just can't make up that much air through a through a makeup air system. But what we do is we do have a makeup air system here. Um, Hopefully you can see my mouse. And if you can't, it's the farthest left, the top left side where you see the blue arrows coming in and down. We have a constant draw of positive pressure coming into this area. And then we also have a constant negative pressure drawing out. The red arrows are depicting the, the exhaust air that we're not recirculating. Um, we're dumping it straight out. So part of the issue is these, these rooms always have to be under negative pressure to ensure that the volatile you know, vapors or whatever is in there is exiting the building and is not sitting or permeating. The, you know, the, physical, uh, the physical characteristics of some of the gases we use, they're denser than air. So if you're not moving it out with a fan, um, then it's, it's lingering and, and it could cause a catastrophic um, problem. So we definitely wanna make sure that um, in the mechanical, schematics of all these buildings that there's adequate air and your mechanical engineer should be able to calculate all those. Extraction equipment and solvent recovery systems that we use, um, just to name a few, not that I picked any one specifically, but ETS makes hydrocarbon extraction systems. On the top left, that's what that looks like. Below that is a um, carbon dioxide system from Eden Labs. Very, very cool system. If you like CO2, I do recommend that system. Um, ethanol extraction, which we all know, um, this is a pinnacle system. It's a very simple 
system yet effective. Um, and also it's pretty economic at scale. Um, the lower picture is a kind of a newly built uh, system that integrates the ethanol um, with, a, with a screw press. So it presses out all of the material, um, the ethanol especially from the material, and you can recover all the cannabinoids that way as well. Um, to the right of that, ice water extraction, very simple, straightforward extraction process, ice and water, no solvents, very safe, very clean, um, produces great extracts. And then um, to the far right, solvent recovery from ethanol extraction typically uh, is what's going to be happening in this falling film evaporator. Um, but, you know, minus the ex ice water extraction, all these processes are, are you know, a little a little bit volatile. Um, some of them aren't carbon dioxide, it's not volatile, but there's super high pressures involved with that. And that can also be catastrophic. The refinement purification equipment we also use. Um, different reactors, we use mechanical cold traps, um, vacuum ovens, we use wiped film evaporators to purify cannabinoids, as well as short path distillation apparatuses. The ancillary support equipment, Highly, highly important for any operation. Um, pneumatic pressure, always needed. Condensing chillers, as we discussed, are a huge part of our processes. If we don't have uh, autonomous temperature control, we can't do a lot of things we need to do. Um, the hoods and the exhaust systems that we use um, as well to, to safeguard our processes are essential um, as support equipment as well. And our vacuum pumps, this particular pump is an explosion proof pump. So if you're using any condensable, uh, flammable condensable vapors, you know, using something like this um, in conjunction with a cold trap is probably your best bet, um, depending on what the, what the vapor is like. Sometimes ethanol or alcohol condensable vapors can be um, condensed and, and, and they can actually end up in like a rotary vein pump and it's okay, you just have to clear out um, the oils. But again, specifically, you wanna try to minimize condensable vapors going through things like vacuum pumps that could create potential hazards, maybe a fire um, or just wear out your pump and eat it up. General and basic safety training. Um, Employee safety is at the foremost um, of, of any, well, uh, uh, should be at the foremost of any operation. Um, employees are the biggest variable. Sometimes they can be unfocused. Sometimes they can be not thorough enough and forgetful. And really safety is just one of those things that has to be governed by everyone. It really does affect it. If someone does something uh, you know, not so, not so intelligent um, and you're just happening to walk by that area at that time, you could be the one that's affected and not even the person that was doing the unsafe, unintelligent task. Um, so really everyone needs to watch out with safety. This is how um, you go home at the end of the day. And unfortunately there's been instances where people have showed up to work and they didn't leave. So I you know, don't wanna get too morbid, but ultimately safety is paramount. Equipment safety, proper training and retraining on equipment and processes. One of the things that I've seen in our industry that's not so great is when someone buys a piece of equipment, it doesn't even matter what it is, um, they're not getting the continued training that they're gonna need to perform those tasks, to perform the maintenance um, and keep that, keep that unit running. So definitely just as, just as important uh, as, as employee and personal safety, equipment safety as well. Facility safety is the final kind of piece to this. And, you know, really that's on the, the people who are, I guess, running that operation really need to do a good job of um, going through emergency procedures uh, and training drills with, uh, with all the employees. The biggest thing is when an accident occurs or when an event unfolds that some, you know, something needs to happen, you want everyone that's there to be doing the same thing. You want everyone to be exiting the building the same way. You want everyone to be, you know, doing the exact same thing. Um, chaos can, in an in a emergency situation is definitely the worst thing that can happen. An extraction lab is the most opportune place for accidents to occur. Lab technicians and extraction equipment operators should ensure they are always prepared with the most up-to-date training and with appropriate PPE. Uh, for the task they're performing. So our glorious PPE 
typically in any cannabis lab on the right hand side, you're going to wear at least one to two of these things every single day. The hard hat is the only one that you might not wear every day, but there's certain, certainly some items on this list that are you know, non-negotiable. Um, for instance, eye protection. Your eyes are the most important organ on your body, so you better protect those. Um, again, like I said, non-negotiable. Anybody in your lab, even if they're walking through, um, you should probably instill, um, you know, that into their into their psyche so that they know every time I walk in this lab, I need to wear some some eye protection, maybe even some hair protection, whatever. So essentially, PPE is ultimately all important, but if there's really certain things, it's the gloves, the skin protection, um, lab coats are great, but if you don't have a lab coat or you don't have lab coats for your employees, just make sure they're wearing long sleeve shirts, pants, um, you know, I've seen, I've seen even, you know, pH down in, in a grow, you know, cause burns um, on people that it was like concentrated and they got on their skin. So at any point in time in any part of our industry, but especially the lab, uh, PB is essential. Here in beer nets um, kind of serve two purposes. Uh, they keep things out and also keep stuff from your hair and from your like burning your beard maybe um, if you got the if you got it too close to uh, something that had an open flame and I know these these guys these days with these huge beards um, you know you want to protect that it took you a long time to grow it I'm sure so definitely those are some non-negotiable items um, and then I added a little more on respirators just because I, I don't see enough respirators uh, used in the extraction facilities it really does help a lot. Um, there's all kinds of stuff flying around. There's all kinds of vapors um, in, in, in commercial or industrial scale uh, laboratories that are doing high throughput extractions with ethanol. And it's, it's just not good to be breathing that in all, all the time. So there's different respirators for different jobs and, and the cartridges all are different as well. So you need to make sure you have the right tool for the right job, but the right mask for the, for the proper reason. General safety tips um, in all extraction facilities and, and hazardous locations, a good practice is just grounding all of the steel components um, where you're using any volatile or flammable solvents. When using, um, when using with closed loop extraction equipment, nitrogen gas and two, um, you shouldn't overpressurize your system. Those systems are rated for certain pressures and using a higher pressure gas uh, can be dangerous if you're not paying attention. Uh, what you can do to prevent any kind of overpressurization is you can just make sure to get a regulator. I've seen people not use regulators, which scared me, but um, you know, it's part of the education processes. You know, you're, you're, only, you're only as good as what you know. And if you've never had the opportunity to learn the stuff the right way, well, I you know, can't hold it totally against you, but um, safety, again, paramount. Another important general safety tip, um, CO2 and N2 are, are asphyxiant. They're simple asphyxiants. So an O2, monitor is great, uh, O2 monitor is great to have in your lab. If you notice that there's oxygen being displaced, you might do something about it. But if you have no idea, then it's going to just be too late before you find out. Um, also, LP gases are also asphyxiant. So propane and butane in concentrations are also not good to breathe in. Um, and we'll get into that in, a, in one more slide. Um, also be mindful when disposing of common acids and bases. Uh, with, with the proliferation of some of the processes now in our, in our sphere, there's a lot of use of, of common acids and common bases. And those things need to be reduced and diluted before they're disposed of so that there's no harmful chloride ions, sodium ions as byproducts, and proteins or hydroxides. Um, that are created so that you, you're not you're not destroying anything downstream that you're not aware of. The lesser known fact about workplace hazards is we were just talking about butane. So the you know butane has a recommended exposure limit um, set by the NIOSH um, group. So that's that's at 800 ppm. Uh, that's not a lot, but if you're exposed to that much butane at a constant rate you're not gonna die, you're, you're, it's just not gonna be pleasant, but you're not gonna die. 
Um, the, the biggest one is, you know, this thousand PPM. So the, the total kind of exposure limit to butane isn't very high that you need to kind of be in a dangerous position, but this is more talking about um, the, the air around you and you know, what you need to do to ensure that it doesn't increase past this. So what we've been discussing with like the integrated fans in these control areas is their job is to keep that limit at a, like at a, at a manageable level if there's any off gassing. So 2100 PPM is what, um, is what equates to 10% LEL. Um, so if your room is, you know, it doesn't matter how big your size is, if it's hitting 10% of that lower explosive limit on your gas sensor, that means that there's 2100 ppm of, of butane or hazardous vapor in the air, and it could be catastrophic for you. Documentation, documentation, documentation. Um, general practice, general safety, this kind of ties into all that. This is a uh, um, everybody on this, on this present or everybody on this call really knows this viscerally, but the documentation from the perspective of the operator is just, it's, it's never on, on the priority list as like the first thing. But if you really want to, you know, if you want to look at this business and industry holistically, you're going to say, well, look, this is, this is what every other industry does where they're documenting everything and we're just getting to the point now where we're we're taking the steps and the measures to to capture the data of the important stuff that we've been missing for years um but it all revolves around the education though that that's a huge piece that includes sops that you're giving to your employees to read so that they understand the processes even if you're training them hands-on you still need to have that documentation so that they can reference um, part of that reference is also sign off. If you're training somebody on a process, well, you should sign them off that they've read and understood and performed to your um, standard, this process, and you should have that documented. Because if anything does happen, that's where, you know, the first place that any investigator is going to look. Um, training manuals, super important. So not just the SOP on the process, but train them on the equipment. So if you're using multiple devices or instruments to conduct one process or one product, then you need to have training manuals and you need to have adequate training time on each of those instruments for your staff. Um, this is essential so they don't break expensive equipment, which happens far too often. Um, also, so they don't hurt themselves, potentially. Um, the biggest thing though, I would say is the continuity of the use and the processes. If, you know, if you're trying to standardize a process to create a product every time, you really wanna urge your staff to, to, to conduct the same steps. Maybe you have three different people at various times uh, conducting the same process. Well, you wanna make sure between the first and the third guy or, or person rather, maybe it's not a, not a guy, maybe it's a, a, a woman, um, but the first person to the third person, everything is, as, as much as the same as possible. And that comes with that, that training time. So the, the training essentials for extraction um, that I would say that's really the most important is training on hazardous material handling. Um, so part of that is like the, the safety data sheets, gotta, gotta have that. Um, equipment operation, as we just discussed how important that is, and the emergency procedures as we, we discussed earlier. You just, you want everybody moving in the same direction in the case of an emergency. Um, hazardous material inventory, part of that documentation step is like just informing everyone around you what's going down in your facility. So not just for the regulators, not just for like the fire marshal, but this should be an essential for your staff. Um, so they understand the danger and they understand the levels of danger. Also, it's good to know how much volume of these solvents you need to keep on site. Um, perhaps you need, to, you need to get rid of solvents. So you need to make sure you have enough or um, sorry, you need to order more solvents. So. Record keeping, again, I'll say it, maintaining strong housekeeping and organizational habits is crucial to recording valuable information in the near and long term and fosters a safer environment. You can't analyze what you can't organize. Um, 
very basic, you know, observations that you're going to make during processes like filling vessels, you're going to have to write those things down for the next person to be able to, to read into it. Let's say you have an issue with the vessel like this vessel here, which was in the field that I took a picture of. Um, this is, it's, it's been overexpanded by the pressure. So uh, that's not a good thing if you're using this vessel to put pressurized gas in every day and use. Common lab mishaps. These are just some photos and we'll kind of run through these quickly, but we've all seen this, we've all been there, um, but this happens when you're not paying attention and when you're not patient. So um, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest tricks is just being patient and staying on task and being mindful. This is hard to do anyway, but when you add cannabis to the mix, for some reason it gets harder. So one of my favorite is just the broken glass nonstop, definitely, uh, definitely why a lot of operators move to stainless steel to reduce this risk of breaking very expensive, very hard to replace pieces. Um, and a little joke I, I always tell employees is if you see China on your paycheck, you didn't win a trip. Um, gotta love when you get things out of the box and they're broken, happens all the time. That's a real big pain in the butt. But essentially, you know, you have to just make sure that you're analyzing and checking everything coming, um, coming to your lab, whether it's ingredients, whether it's equipment, instruments, replacement parts, whatever. Uh, effective OEM of defective equipment. This is the best. So this on the left is a CO2 machine, very expensive CO2 machine um, produced by an American OEM. And they had a crane to lift up off the top cap of the CO2 extractor because it was so heavy. Well, it was so heavy that it broke the crane. <laughs> so not, uh, not a very thorough process of picking their instruments for, for their equipment, but this happens a lot. And so as an operator, you have to deal with a lot of different issues. One of them is other people's problems. Um, and on the right as well, just a uh, overexpanded vessel that came out. Severe accidents in the lab and catastrophic failures. Um, safety hazards and dangerous lab practices are tinder for a catastrophic accident or fire, both literally and figured. Um, one example of dangerous lab practice would be in the case of an electri electrically operated vacuum pump. So there was, a, there was an instance where a group was using a butane extractor and they were vacuuming the system down to create um, you know, the vacuum pressure in the system to kind of help the, the solvent flow through. But they were doing this process with, a, with an electrical rotary vein pump. And what happens is most of the time when you're conducting this process, there's volatile vapors in the lines that you're using to connect the hoses that you're using to connect the vessels together. Well, in this case, that's what happened. This lab was in Hollister. Um, on the left, you'll see the before pictures, beautiful, clean, nice. On um, the bottom, you'll see the extractor in the room. But what they were doing was they were running a line outside of the booth that was adjacent to this compressor. And that's what happened. Um, on the right, you see the aftermath. The vapor came through in the pump and it expanded and there was a spark and it created a huge fire. This facility, uh, all the fire sprinklers went off in this facility on the outside of that booth. So the booth really didn't prevent anything from happening um, because they weren't conducting the operations properly. They were doing exactly what they weren't supposed to do, but it was easier for them to do. So these are the types of things that can happen in an instant. And now that lab is shut down and they are no longer operational. So I've added some videos here. Um, and in the sake of time, I'm just gonna rush through these as much as possible, but uh, these are just some common mishaps uh, from not paying attention, not following protocols, uh, not following SOPs, and uh, just, you know, in general terms, a basic disaster. So this first video is kind of funny because they're doing this hydrocarbon extraction process, which is with a closed loop machine, um, but they're doing it in the same area co-located with their vacuum pumps and their ovens um, that you can see in the back of the photo there. So big no-no, but we'll see what happens. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Okay, hold on one second. Might take a moment to uh, 
to load there. Yeah. Like, we've been seeing a little bit I, of lag on some of the slides. I was hoping that it was going to allow me to just show you. That. Okay, here we go. Yeah, on our end, we're not seeing the, the video yet. So maybe it's- Yeah, it's still, it's giving me the spinning wheel of death here. So ah, um, okay. bear with me for a moment. If not, these will be available on online. Oh, here we go. Do you see it now? Uh, it might be lagging just a little bit. It usually takes a second. Uh, I'm not, I'm still not seeing it on my end, no. Give me, uh, give me one sec here. Okay, did I stop my share? Yeah, I believe you just stopped the share. All right, give me one sec here. Well, it may it may not uh, want to cooperate with me here on this, so let me just keep. I'll just keep going and try the next next video. These okay. are just good examples, um, kind of showing everyone here like what not to do. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I don't know if it likes it. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't. I don't think it likes it. Okay. Okay. So that's okay. All right. Let me. Uh, let me get back in here. Then. Sorry about this, guys. Give me a no, second. Not a problem. Not a problem. Technical difficulties happen. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm not even sure we should attempt the other ones then. Yeah, I think the videos aren't working. We could probably just continue on. Okay. Um, these are some graphic videos of some fires that have broken out in some of these labs catastrophic fires um if you if you don't like to see stuff like that i suggest you don't watch it um brings us to kind of the last section here this is accident prevention so accident prevention includes all measures taken in an effort to save lives just simply put um, the reason why you mitigate risk is so that nobody ends up losing their life or a limb and um you know that guilt being with you for the rest of your life so how we prevent accidents, read the OEM manuals and specifications carefully. Everything you need to know will be in that manual. Avoid moving too quickly in the lab. Don't rush. That's when accidents really happen. Move with a purpose or move deliberately is what I say. That's kind of a, a, a key there. Um, and also just be considerate of other people's safety. Uh, my motto and mantra is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Small parts can have a huge impact in this process. So another common failure is just over torquing and stripping brass nuts from tri-clamp assemblies. Um, most all equipment, hydrocarbon, CO2, ethanol, even in most cases, will use some form of assembly that has a brass nut. And the way that you prevent stripping those things is you are using torque a torque wrench. So um, over tightening hardware, use a torque wrench to tighten down brass. You can set the torque per the recommended spec that's in your manual, and you can ensure that you never strip a bolt. And then the other side of that is you have to constantly be changing and swapping out these consumable parts that you know have a, a, a limit where they're just not going to be functional. Anymore. So replace the worn out hardware create a maintenance um, and replacement schedule and just stick to it. Um, the wrenches are, uh, are incredibly um, reliable, but they also need to be calibrated. So store your wrench properly. Make sure that there's no tension on the spring for too long a time because that spring will get worn out. Um, calibrate it once a year if you need to. And if you mishandle it, just get it done. These small costs that are involved in this stuff, although it may be um, inconvenient is essential. 
Because once something fails, you're going to look back and you're going to say, wow, a $20 service to my torque wrench, but that I didn't want to pay because it was $20 to service my torque wrench um, could have saved someone, um, you know, their life. Perform equipment inspections regularly. Most lab equipment comes with some form of consumer, like we discussed, a bearing, a seal, a bolt, a nut, refrigerant, lubricant, anything possible that you could think of that would need to be replenished or replaced, it does. And so having, having an understanding and having a system to do that is essential. And that's what's really going to make sure that your equipment, uh, the equipment life is extended. And also everyone's, everyone's kind of, um, you know, experience in the lab is also intact and they're not going to have issues or they're not going to you know be frustrated on a continual basis because you're performing these things regularly routine maintenance it ensures operator safety and it's clearly the way to uh, ensure the instruments are operational and running correctly on a continual basis uh, regular recommend maintenance leak checks thread and seal checks hose checks relief devices the p those prvs um, in some of these equipment, they're also spring loaded. So if you are overpressurizing and the PRV is going off a lot, well, it's going to wear out and it eventually will fail. And when you overpressurize and it doesn't go off, then you have a, a really big problem on your hands. So every component that's on that machine is essential to check and make sure it's running and operating properly. And that's how you're going to stay safe. Key takeaways, cannabis is awesome. Regulations must be administered to provide more safety standards. Um, all operating cannabis and hemp manufacturing facilities will, if they haven't already, adopt universal standard operating philosophies in the near term as the global demand for these products increase and the quality standard becomes more stringent. And um, be cautious on, uh, in the lab. Move deliberately and ensure the safety of those around you. And that's my time, guys. Thank you so much for going on that journey with me. Um, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm open to, to answer and field any. Thank you, Simon. That was a really thorough presentation. I actually <laughs> learned quite a bit. I, there's a lot that I didn't know that was in there. So that, that was really helpful. Thank you. I actually do have a question. So, you know, you'd mentioned there was a section in there about, you know, if China's on your paycheck, then, um, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> it's, you're not winning, right? <laughs> um, so I'm curious. Uh, Obviously, we hear about things with China glass and people are, I mean, it could be from anywhere. I mean, but China is kind of the most notorious one, right? Um, where we have glassware that's basically not built to a certain standard to prevent some types of, you know, workplace accidents from happening. Um, are, do any of these regulations that you reference speak to certain quality of glass or a certain level of, you know, I guess, um, I guess of sturdiness of your, your glassware? Um, that's a great question. Um, so actually, no, uh, there isn't. And because, because there's really not in any other sense either, right? And like in your lab setting, let's say, you can use kind of whatever you have, right? And you're just yeah. gonna have to, you're just gonna have to monitor and meter um, the pressures that you're putting in there. For us, what we've done is collectively, all extractors basically at this point, have basically said, if we're doing certain processes, we're only gonna buy from, X, uh, these, these three suppliers, um, they have, you know, we've basically weeded out the suppliers that are going to give us the, the not so great equipment. Um, and we also have now American made glass blowers who are doing the heavy wall stuff that we need for some of these catalytic conversions and this, these synthetic processes, but essentially, you know, we will just move to stainless steel. I, I like glass personally. I just, I love seeing what's going on but um yeah i mean it really depends what what i've seen and noticed is japanese glass is really high quality german glass is very high quality and american manufacturers are creating the quality needed to kind of keep up with the competition there except for the cost there's a huge cost delta and um you know that's really what it comes down to and i feel personally i feel like a lot of safety boils down to what does that mean for my wallet um, and that's not the right way to think about it. So fortunately, unfortunately, you're going to have to kind of use your best judgment when, when you're deciding and picking equipment or instrument uh, vendors. But if you're using 
high quality stuff, use the high quality stuff for the really um, like the really dramatic tasks that take a lot of vacuum pressure or that, that create, you have, you need an, an immense amount of volume. You definitely don't want to get a 50 liter, uh, like round bottom flask from China. That's for sure. Um, but just an American one might be too expensive, but now it's a great question. I have never even heard anyone ask that question. And it's interesting because now I'm wondering, is there a standard for that? I mean, it, it would, you know, you could do all these things correctly, but if you got the wrong equipment, then you're setting yourself up for failure. And so that I just was wondering, because I mean, it would make sense to me that they would have some sort of criteria standard, because if again, you're doing everything else right, but somehow you got the wrong equipment, now suddenly you're dealing with all sorts of hazards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, I, I gotta be honest, like in the beginning when I was doing a lot of this process, I would just go to the like the quartz glass blower guy in Colorado that I knew, like the OG guy, and, I, and he was a scientific glass blower by trade. So I just had him blow me all of like my own custom round bottoms or whatever. Um, it's, it's really the, like the, the really expensive custom white film, um, like the white film, uh, glass apparatuses that are the most, like the most temperamental, anything, one of them was actually on, and that was an AIG. That was a, that was a nice glass manufacturer and the joint broke off those, those things. If you break something like that, from a high quality manufacturer, you're just basically extending the time that you're gonna get that thing back fixed. If you go from a, I hate to say it, but if you go from like a cheap vendor, you might be able to replace it faster with another, another component, a brand new component rather than fixing a broken component. So it really is a, a necessity driven thing. If I have a task to complete, I might be willing to, to roll the dice on some glass that I buy from a Chinese company. Gotcha. So it's really just use your best judgment. I, I mean, from my perspective, but if you have any real feelings toward that and you're really against it, sure. I mean, you just don't do it and you'll probably be saved in the end, but and that's not the reality for most operators. They're on a schedule. They have to complete a task. And, you know, uh, part of the greatest thing about all of us in this industry is we're great solution makers. We can find a solution for any problem. Just give us enough time researching. Definitely. All right, uh, do we have any other questions for Simon? Feel free to type them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Just give everyone a couple of minutes here and... All right. Uh, no one's speaking up. So um, I guess we will conclude the September Journal Club. Uh, thank you, Simon, so much for taking the time this morning to educate us on this. Again, I learned a lot and I hope the rest of you did as well. And uh, everyone have a great rest of your Thursday. Such a pleasure. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to the ACS. Thank you, Kyle. And thanks, Brittany. Appreciate you guys. Looking forward to the next one. All right. Take care, Simon. See ya.